Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm, my name is Jim Burns. I'm reading, by the way, because this, I'll just get totally lost otherwise. Uh, I've been drawing and painting, let's call it um, spacey stuff, uh, since I was first able to grasp a pencil. Uh, I remember being drawn to the, the weird and the wonderful whilst still at primary school. Strange machines and unlikely creatures inhabiting my infantile scrawlings from maybe, from maybe the age of five or six, uh, old, six years old. I turned my hobby into something resembling a career, uh, if being paid to draw something that had previously simply be, been fun, can be called a career. Uh, some 43 years ago, in 1972, uh, whilst I was still at St. Martin's School of Art, I was paid the princely sum of £13.50 uh, for a piece of work I would just as soon not draw your attention to today. Um, the spacey stuff gradually morphed into a, uh, a more distinguished art form called science fiction art. Um, more recently, to cover a wider gamut of possibilities, uh, the art of the fantastical. And currently the preferred term is imaginative realism. Uh, yes, I'm an imaginative realist these days, uh, suggesting I now possess a certain uh, gravitas and an implied respect previously uh, denied to spacey stuff. Um, although I've yet to see that a new higher regard materialise in any meaningful way, by which I mean that I used to earn more when I was doing spacey stuff. Um, <coughs> For those of you who aren't familiar with uh, my own work, and to give you a bit of context as to where I'm coming from, and maybe to give a clue as to the place Dan Dare and his creator Frank Hampson hold in my heart and in my imagination, I'll show you a few pieces of my own work. Um, after these, I'll move on with an overview of my careers, plural. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, my careers, plural. There have been two, two careers, although the first one was very short-lived, and how in very large part it was that man Hampson and Colonel Dare who seem to, in large part, choreograph my life for me, albeit probably unconsciously on my, my part. So I'll just run a few, a th few things of mine. I'm sorry about the flashing. We really, the, the tech guys here don't know what it's all about, and neither do I. So is it going to spoil it for you? Are you okay with the flashing? <coughs> okay. I'll figure it out. It's not, it's not, on, the, it's not on the iPad. Um, it is literally just on the projection, so it's up there somewhere. Um, so we've got a piece there called Darwin. Yeah, I'll whip through these quickly because you'd be far more interested in the, in the dare stuff, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, already you can see with this kind of work that, um, yeah, you've got this, the, the admixture of aliens and weirdness and spacecraft and strange uh, landscapes and, um, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful space girls. They do inhabit my paintings. Um, yes, Jerry, you just bought a, a full-size print of this one, didn't you? It's a piece called Wanderers I created for um, a convention in America called Deluxecon a few years back. And more recently, I've been doing work in, in the 90s, actually, in, in the early 2000s for Peter Hamilton. And Peter Hamilton's probably Britain's uh, biggest selling science fiction artist, I would imagine, uh, science fiction writer. And I, I did a lot of covers for uh, uh, Peter Hamilton's books. And this is one of them, Dreaming Void. Again, I think. For those of you who've got the eye for it, you can probably see the unconscious elements that have crept through from my childhood and remain their organic shapes. I always associated Frank Hampson's uh, machines with a sort of an, an organic look about them, uh, rather than sharp-edged particularly. I do this kind of thing as well, private commission, that's a friend's wife dressed up as a space girl. Um, it's just Portrait of Isabella. Initially I was going to call it, um, uh, what's the word for it, uh, Odalisque. Uh, but she's a very bright girl, and she probably knows the meaning of the word odalisque, which I didn't when I... Uh, it, which basically means sex slave, doesn't it? I just thought it meant the pose. I thought it was the pose of the odalisque, so I called it portrait instead. Um, uh, these are uh, generally completed in um, uh, acrylics. I work most of the time, and this one's on canvas, occasionally on board. I've just got about half a dozen of my own things. This is the last of mine. This is Darwinia for Robert Charles Wilson. Again, some of those exotic scenarios. Anyway... It's only in more recent times that the clear truth of the Hampson Dander influence has become transparently obvious to me. And they did this between them not once but twice as have made two big career choices in life. And they both connect to the influence that comic had on my life. This calls for closer examination. Uh, all of this has its roots in childhood and the excitement and wonder I experienced each week as the eagle comic plopped onto the doormat. If I was lucky, I got to it before my father. <laughs> who, after all, was the guy paying for it. Um, ostensibly, he bought it for me, but he couldn't resist it either. Uh, Second World War memories for him, perhaps, he, as he was ground crew on Spitfires at RAF Tangmere, Manston and North Weald, um, the Battle of Britain airfields, and the air aces whose planes he helped service, inevitably connecting with the character of Dan Dare in his own imagination, perhaps. 
he would have been one of those kinds of guys. It's not actually him, but uh, that was his job. Anyway, they say you, it says you get really quite old. I was 67 last Friday, and the bones are certainly informing me in no uncertain terms that I'm not that spry young fellow anymore. Uh, yes, as you get older, the short-term memory is no longer much to be trusted. Um, it gets harder to recall what you were doing yesterday or, or even earlier this morning. Um, while the stuff that filled your time when you were young gains a new clarity. Uh, and certainly amongst my fellow pensioner artists, um, at least the British ones, as the light starts to dim and the old memories come flooding back, Colonel Daniel McGregor Dare uh, seems once again to have started to loom large in the casual conversations of interested artists of my own generation. And of course, as witnessed by today's nostalgia fest. But then again, maybe in part, it's because some new visionaries have started to convince us that something resembling Dan's world isn't so far off after all. Probably minus the dreams and the mighty Mekon. Uh, we've already heard from one such visionary. Uh, Alan Bond and his mighty Skylon. Um, if ever a machine looked like the kind of vehicle we imagined back in the 50s and 60s would take us into space, it's Skylon. Uniquely British romanticism in its lines. Uh, maybe that's just the ir irrational artist in me. But so much more elegant than those utilitarian American and Russian chemical stacks that they are still staking their space-going futures on. Even the shuttle looks like a workhorse machine, no concession to beauty in its admittedly impressive form. Skylon looks just a bit like something that Frank Hampson might have taken a hand in the design of. I imagine that the visions of Frank Hampson helped sow that seed in the young Alan Bond's mind. I think you've already convinced yes. us that's the case. Uh, that's, of course, the ship flown by Lero the Crypt in the story of the Man from Nowhere. But, you know, not so far away, not so far away from Skylon. Um, and, of course, as we've been told before, Don Harley was one of the credited arti artists alongside Hampson on this story. The two names, bottom left there, I think, um, yeah. I don't know if it happened with every... Um, a joint bit of enterprise, but certainly every time it was Frank Harley, his name was often included there in the uh, signature at the bottom alongside Frank's. Uh, favorite. It's a favorite story of mine, this one, I must say. It's um, along with its two sequels, uh, Rogue Planet and the, its evil fants, uh, determined uh, to, 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 to exterminate the crypts. Here's um, Lero again. Uh, and here's Gogol, the scary fan chief manhandling the puny Earthman, Dan. Stripey, just getting away in the nick of time. Nobody's mentioned Stripey yet. We've got to have Stripey <laughs> mentioned. Um, and then Reign of the Robots, of course, the third of them, the Electrobots. While Stan has been away helping the crypts in their struggle against the pants, the mighty meek on his dreams have conquered the Earth with an army of robots. I seem to dimly recall that this was around the time that the Eagle was first delivered to our house, late in 1955, maybe. The f this frame seems to contain most of the main human characters uh, from that time. Sir Hubert Guest, uh, top right, trapped in some kind of suspended animation. Um, Dan passing Professor Peabody on the steps. Lex O'Malley in the duffel coat, giving a tree a well-delivered thump to whatever passes for a Venusian solar plexus. Whilst Flamer Spry brings the same guy down and, uh, with a nice rugby tackle. Hank Hogan, employing some kind of judo throw. Pierre Lafayette and Digby sorting out another pair of trains in the foreground. I do definitely remember as a kid being mightily impressed by the Mekon's deadly army of electrobots. That image just really sort of impressed me. Those little guys down there. Uh, I've been told my own robots have a somewhat, ele uh, somewhat retro look about them, and I suppose th uh, this one, illustrated for a... A Guy Haley story it does have a little electrobot DNA about it, if that's not a contradiction in terms, robots and DNA, I don't know. Um, <coughs> that's how it looks in the, in the actual finished image. This was created for uh, a yeah, Guy Haley story for Interzone magazine, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And um, then, of course, when the electrobots weren't really up to the job, were they? Um, in came the Select robots. Um, don't remember those guys. I never thought they uh, they quite had that kind of ring of conviction that the electrobots did. Another endearing little character that appeared at this time, of course, was Stripey, the little alien striped pig, come tiny elephant-like creature uh, that got particularly attached to Digby and Flamer. So I was, I was too young to have experienced the earliest Dan Dare stories. Uh, I think my dad started subscribing to Eagles supposedly on my behalf. It was in late 55, by which time the first half of the, the golden Hampson years had been and gone. 
But I was enthralled to the character of Dan Dare through the late 50s and then also into the Frank Bellamy period uh, before I finally started focusing more on those other things that preoccupy a teenage boy's hormonally driven imagination. Um, But there Dan resided in the back of my mind, urging me on to a mysterious something. By my mid-teens, his voice was becoming really quite loud and insistent. And what that voice was saying at that time has nothing to do with art, which I was certainly very much occupied with, but more the huge interest I had in aircraft. I was a regular attendee at the St. Athan Air Display in South Wales, drooling over the Hawker Hunters. Was there ever a more beautiful jet? And the more solid and less graceful Gloucester Javelins, So, how does this all connect up? Uh, An itch was starting that had to be scratched. Uh, Let's be accurate about timelines. I was always going to be 19 years older than Dan Dare, as the fictional Dare was born in 1967, whilst I was born in 1948. In the real world of the here and now, men who would be Dan's current age, 48, are already too old to be flying typhoons, never mind Anastasia or Tempest Frangit. Uh, that amazing stuff didn't even really begin to happen in the, in the real world. It's a, it's a long way off yet. So whilst the timelines are somewhat skewed when the real world and Dan's fictional world collide, for a young man like myself who might have entertained the idea that space is calling to me, um, the realistic first step into emulating my hero was to join the RAF as a trainee pilot uh, back in 1966. Uh, Dan's birthday, the birth, was still a year in the future. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't have his lantern jaw. Um, uh, <laughs> um, in, ni- <laughs> um, so in 19, 1966, uh, uh, Dan's birth was still a year in the future, so in 1966 that meant machines of a more mundane species, but exciting nonetheless, so I applied and sec- successfully gained entrance into the uh, RAF as a student pilot his acting pilot officer being pointed at up there. Um, uh, Yeah, that's at uh, RAF South Cerny, uh, the uh, initial training school in uh, Gloucestershire, RAF South Cerny. Then after, I can't remember how long I was there, four months it might have been, then I moved on to um, RAF Church Fenton, aged 18, where I soloed on chipmunks. Uh, before moving then up to RAF Acklington onto the, the old hunting jet provost Mark III, and that's me after my first solo flight on, on the Jet Provost. I was able to take a jet up to 30,000 feet, do aerobatics and all the rest of it, all on my own, but I couldn't drive a car. <laughs> <laughs> around, this time, around this time, I failed my first driving test, but uh, they still let me fly one of these things. That's the kind of clue as to the way things were going to go. But from, you know, from little acorns to mighty oaks theoretically grow, today, RAF Church Fenton, tomorrow, Venus. Yes. But as luck would have it, I was really not a very good pilot. I was taking too long to train, and in the cuts at the Defence White Paper of 1966, and then two further supplements to it over the next two years, as well as the famous cancellations of projects such as the Hedgehopper Bomber, as it was called, TSR-2. Quite a machine, still looks absolutely amazing, you know, for a a 60s design. and the, uh, another one they cancelled was the P-1154, the supersonic VTOL development of the Harrier. Never happened. And perhaps in some ways the most amazing, but the one that's always forgotten, the Armstrong Whitworth 681 vertical takeoff transport aircraft. Now that, um, the engines, as you can see, have got the vectoring, what have you, in the um, engines there. I can't imagine the racket that plane would have made. If you've, if you've been close to a Harrier taking off, it is barely noisy. You've got four of them in one plane, basically. Anyway, that went. Um, a clamping down on other wasteful areas by the, the, uh, in the defence white paper, such as indulging slow learning pilots with expensive extra flying training hours, that, that was imposed heavily, which spelled the end for my short lived <coughs> flying career. I would never be, never be, stop coughing for goodness sake, take another swig of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I would never be, a, oh, he's been suffering from last night, haven't you? Gosh. Um, I'd never be the real-life Dan Dare. 
Uh, my last flight was with squadron leader Gathercole, and everyone, everyone knew that a flight with him indicated probable permanent snatching away of the toys, unless one could pull some very fancy cats out of the bag. That last flight was a formation flight, not the easiest stuff to do. And when I nearly flew my jet provost at the jet pipe of the aircraft in front of me, and Gadical had to snatch the stick away with an urgent, I have control, I knew the game was up and my goose was cooked. Um, during these years, of course, real space, real space had started. And unfortunately, it wasn't a Dan Dare who was up there uh, possessing the cosmos for Britain. No, a brave man named was circling the earth, followed by others, both Russian and American. Britain adopted out. There'd be no Britain in space until 1991 when Helen Sharman went up, uh, who I had the pleasure to meet last year at Longcon 3 convention, uh, along with the Russian cosmonaut Anatoly Artsibarsky. Have I got that right? That's right. Artsibarsky, yeah. Became the first woman to visit the Mir space station. We're hoping to have them both here at the BIS in June. Brilliant. Probably. Brilliant. Yes, let's come along. Uh, this, by the way, I met her at one of um, Jerry's famous convention parties where his. Um, his legendary generosity with the bubbly, the scotch and the vodka <laughs> is, 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 is hugely appreciated, particularly the mornings after. Um, okay, I won't linger on my rather enfeebled RAF career, um, other than to say it seems now to have been a life lived by another man. Um, I left the service with a view to going, to going for a second career option, which also connected very much to that Dandere world. I knuckled down to getting some artwork done. I also managed to collect work from my old grammar school. Uh, Mrs. Rowlands, my art teacher, with some prescience, actually hung on to my old stuff from a few years before. Her comment, this is what you should have been doing two years ago, were probably wise words, but I was still passing through a phase of great disappointment. Um, though not so disappointed as my father, who did not like the idea of his eldest son going from smart officer material in the, in the RAF to long haired art college layabout in the 1960s. <laughs> and our hair was pretty long back then. Uh, it soured our relationship for a long time, I regret to say. Although in the end, he did concede I'd probably made the right choice. Um, a further blow at that time was that whilst I was in the RAF, my parents moved house, an ill-fated decision to take a pub, the Green Dragon in Chepstow. Uh, it's since demolished, I think. And as part of the move, my mum decided that I clearly had no further use for my huge collection of hundreds of near mint old eagle comics, and without referring back to me, chucked the lot out. <laughs> Along with all my airfix aircraft models dangling from my bedroom ceiling with the line, they were only gathering dust, James. <laughs> um, so, to, <laughs> to cut the long story short, a year on a foundation course at uh, Newport, and then three years at St Martin's School of Art in London. All that time I was to the complete bafflement of my tutors, allowing the siren voice, uh, not so much Dan now perhaps, but his creator, Frank Hampson, pull my interest further and deeper into the world of science fiction art. Nice shot, I think, of Frank Hampson, that one. Um, my tutors saw no potential value in this uh, business of spaceships and aliens and all that spacey stuff, uh, but I persisted with it. Uh, one visiting lecturer in particular championing my cause, uh, Fritz Wegner, the children's book illustrator, who had been part of the Jewish emigration to the UK in the 1930s, fleeing the Nazi threat in his native Austria. And I no noted the rise of artists like uh, Chris Foss and, and Bruce Pennington. Uh, at that time, artists who seemed to convince me that there was a future in this stuff. Not for me in the world of comics, it seemed. My interest was drawn more to, to large single paintings, uh, like the two guys just mentioned, uh, these you know, Pennington and Foss, uh, and with the luxury of a bit more time to develop detail and design ideas that, than comics give you. So back then, the clear market for me was the world of book cover art. Uh, and that has been by far the larger part of my output over the years on both sides of the Atlantic, working for most of the big publishers of science fiction novels. Um, Frank later in life, I recently discovered that Frank Hampson was actually attending my first convention, the 37th World Science Fiction Convention, CECON, in 1979, and I curse myself to this day for not realising it at the time, and uh, introducing myself to my hero. I had a big show of my own work up, and I think we might have had an interesting chinwag. Uh, at least I had managed not to drift too much into gushing, if, well, if I'd not, if I'd managed not to drift into too much into gushing hero worship, which as someone earlier said, that's exactly what always happens with these occasions. <laughs> Uh, I was introduced at that convention to Arthur C. Clarke, who made some nice comments about my rendezvous with Rama paintings. That's the sort of stuff I was doing back in the 
late 70s. Uh, these are all, this is an old oil. I used to use oil paints back then. I've used acrylics mostly since, so I'm thinking of a return to oils. Um, and that's the other Rama painting, of course. Um, these were produced for a book called uh, Alien Landscapes, published by Piero Publishing, for whom I also painted the cover for another book called Mechanismo, written by Harry Harrison, actually, most of it. Um, a painting of a machine I called the Gauzy Fighter went on the cover of that. I'll show it to you in a moment. Uh, but that piece of work did at least give me the chance to work briefly with a man named Brian Lewis, an artist of Frank Hampson's vintage, and who too had worked on the Eagle, but not, as I understand it, on Dandere. But Brian was the artist who created such magnificent work for the Jet Ace Logan strip in the, comic and, uh, in the Comet and later the Tiger, a variation on the Dandere style of space hero set a little further in the future, a similar vibe. Brian contributed to the Mechanismo book a cutaway of my Gauzy fighter, very much influenced by the kind of cutaways that used to be such a feature of the Eagle centerfolds, including, of course, that famous one of Dan's personal ship, Anastasia, the one designed for him by the friendly uh, Treen Sondar. Uh, this cutaway is uncredited, but it's reckoned to be probably by Eric Eden, who I, who I read... Uh, actually fell out with Hank Frank Hampson. I don't know if anyone can confirm that. There will be some possible errors in my research. Uh, feeling that Frank was too hard a taskmaster in the early days of Dandere, and who then moved on to other projects, but did return later to contribute to both art and storylines. Um, here's the cutaway that uh, Brian Lewis supplied to show the inner workings of my gauzy fighter and its accompanying uh, robot sentry. Um, so there's the slide, and then there's the, the original painting from which that derives. That one there, which again was an oil painting for the cover of Mechanismo. And um, as you can see, the floating sentry bot, as they call it there, and uh, Brian created a little cutaway of that. With all these crazy, you know, when you read what the various bits are, that I had no idea that's what I was painting at the time. Um, <laughs> presumably Brian's imagination allowed to run rain on those. And there's Brian Lewis at that, that time. I only met Brian Lewis the once at Piero's office. Um, I remember we were talking, amongst other things, about the business of staying fit in such sedentary work. This is about 1977, 78, 78, I think, I should think. And how illustrators smoked too much, drank too much, got stressed out trying to meet absurd deadlines, and then die young. He was talking about the passing of his good friend, an absolutely brilliant comic artist, Frank Bellamy, uh, just a year or two before at the age of 59. And now we should find better ways of providing for our dependents. Um, Brian told me that Bellamy in particular had left his widow in a fairly penurious state, and people were trying to do something about that at the time, that the non-return of artwork to the artist, a poor state of affairs since rectified, much of it simply got destroyed, or others kept the originals, many of which subsequently became highly collectible. Uh, yes, we were in one of those morbid frames of mind for some reason. I was only 30 then, but had just had a sort of phony heart attack. Um, a panic attack, I suppose, shortly after the birth of my first daughter. Uh, the business of parental responsibility and trying to maintain a living by one's daubs and scribbles as suddenly, I imagine, overwhelmed me in its sheer unlikeliness. Um, I've read how this was very much the situation back in the 50s and 60s too, if not worse. A couple of weeks after this chat, you know, and that's very much how uh, Brian was back in those days, I remember him so well, the guy who was the proprietor of Piero Publishing, Philip Dunn, who was a writer of not very successful science fiction novels and had operated for a short while under the nom de plume of Saul Dunn, because he told me when he finished the first of his steel eye novels, which I painted the cover art, threw down his pen and announced to his wife Jane, it's all done who said, that's your pen name, Saul Dunn. Uh, Philip, Saul, whatever, called his name, called me to say that Brian Lewis, like Frank Bellamy, poor him, had died very suddenly of a heart attack just <coughs> after I'd spoken to him about this subject. Ten years younger than Frank had been. Brian was only 49. Right, okay, Frank, no, some Frank Bellamy stuff, right. I think we all agree that the great Dandere artist was Frank Hampson. Most of the nostalgia resides around that 50s decade and with every justification an atmosphere and mood, a bunch of elusive characteristics that are the soul of the strip. A number of artists contributed to Dandere, Dande, I'll mention some more shortly, but maybe because I didn't really discover the Eagle comic until the second half of the 50s, 
very considerable proportion of my Dander appreciation does happily include the, the work of Bellamy, even though he worked on it for only about a year, I think, on Dander. I read that he wasn't all that enthusiastic about doing the work, and speaking to die-hard Hampsonians, Bellamy is still regarded, regarded as the beginning of the end, that his work was distinctly un unhampsonian. I would say that the stuff he provi provided was distinctly his own work, with absolutely no attempt to try and emulate Hampson's style. Uh, in fact, I read some of that. This was probably, and I've heard from someone earlier, that this was probably a condition of his agreeing to spend that year working on the strip. I'll make the controversial observation, and it is just a personal one, that whilst for me Hampson was the definitive Dandere artist, Frank Bellamy was actually the more accomplished comic artist, strip artist per se, I imagine, I suppose it all hinges on how our own, uh, how our own visual imagine, imaginations work as artists of the fantastical, and it seems to me that Bellamy could really do weird very well indeed. Check out these guys from the Project Nimbus story. Sorry, wrong slide. Hold on. Let me... Yeah, I don't know how that one popped in. I'm rather hoping I can go back, because it's important I say something about that last one. <laughs> how do you go backwards? Hold on. Let's see how it goes. Um, yeah, okay, I might come do it again later on. Forget it. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, it, this I just remember when this comic arrived in the house. These guys, I was so spooked by them. I thought they were so very strange. They still look look very alien. Then his ships, Hampson's ships are fab indeed. Um, and, and Keith Watson, another Dandere artist, was also capable of great work when dealing with machines, although his Dandere characterization is often described as lacking something. Look at the lines in this Bellamy ship, num Nimbus 2, uh, rendezvousing with the Andromeda. He brought a new sharp-edged snazziness to his vessels, somewhat removed from the cosier lines of Anastasia. <coughs> um, uh, note also his uh, dramatic use of light and dark and his incredible design sense. There's something very pleasing about the way Bellamy places elements on the page. Drama revealed at every turn. Um, no concessions here to any kind of earthbound design conventions. Um, and note also the uh, redesigned space fleet helmets, which I know... Hang on, bear with me. Ah, that was in the last one. There. You saw them, bottom right, uh, which I know cheesed off a lot of die-hard Hamsonians. Um, and that uh, Navy and ship. No, here a few more Bellamy images. Uh, Trip to Trouble, excellent Lexa Malley characterization. You might have seen. This is wandering off on its own now. Um, uh, more tech. Um, bear with me. Rescue. His sense of drama was second to none. This is 1960, you remember, it's 55 years ago. It's as effective as anything from current cinema offerings, this stuff. Very dramatic. Uh, uh, his characters were, you know, careworn, time-worn, uh, very real, I think, which, again, perhaps that was something that people found um, not to their liking. I think because of the age I was and the time I hit the comic, for me it's as important in my own memory as the Hampson years and informed what I went on to do myself every bit as much, I think. Bellamy's body of work, including all the other stuff he did apart from Dan, still has huge influence in the world of comic art. Hampson was perhaps more parochial, quintessentially English in his approach. Bellamy had a more global appeal, and towards the end of his life was apparently thrilled at the invitation to work for DC Comics, which then didn't happen due to his early demise. Anyway, here are a few of my own pieces that I like to think paid homage to the great man I believe Bellamy to have been, at least in the lines of the vessels and the weirdness of the aliens. I wouldn't pretend to have his comics artist skills, the sense of spontaneity, but I think he inspired... Here we go inspired me every bit as much as Frank Hampson. Um, that's a digital piece I did not so long ago called, tach I call it Tachyonic, and I did a variation on that. And they're very much Bellamy-influenced kind of sleekness to them. And then for Long Con 3, I created a similar kind of sharp-edged vessel. Um, his weird aliens, I kind of do my own take on them with things like this, which I call Terran Derelict. Um, Another little digital, that Terran Derelict was an old acrylic painting. This is another digital piece which I created. And there's the one you just bought, a recent digital piece for um, uh, one of uh, Ian, Waite's, uh, Ian, Waite, Ian Waite's first novel, The uh, Pelquin's Comet. 
Okay, let's focus a little more on the man who created the character of Dan Dare, pilot of the future in the first place. Dan Dare, pilot of the future in the first place. Frank Hampson, the earliest stories which he wrote and created the art for entirely by himself. Although the increasing workload that came with its burgeoning popularity amongst the young lads and their dads of grey old austerity driven post war Britain meant that others soon contributed to both story and art, storylines and art. Now, if I got this right, this should be. Oh, hang on. One minute. Close up. Um... Oh, sorry, it's another one. That's another one of mine showing the. Um... Yeah, I got my notes all out of order, as so many of us do, I'm afraid. Uh, the alien bottom right was kind of influenced by the um, kind of. Uh... Those creatures I loved so much as a kid. The, the, the model was my middle daughter, Megan, by the way, um, <coughs> model for that. Again, very much um, I use uh, family members, um, just as Frank Hampson did, to model for aspects of the, the various characters in the ongoing sagas and what have you. Um, right. All right, oh, was, here we go. <laughs> uh, that was a piece I did for um, a cover called Space Opera, again, the colour, I think the colour is partly influenced by comic art. It's not a comic piece, but it's um, the bright colours of comic art. A uh, book called Space Opera. Um, that was a painting. This is a digital piece which I completed for uh, The Forever War, the Joe Haldeman novel. <clears throat> which I understand is going to be turned into a film by Ridley Scott, so they say. Which would be good because it is one of the. It's probably the greatest of all military science fiction novels. I think the Forever War. <laughs> and then from that same story, the uh, the alien Torans, of course, um, kind of weird guys. Again, very much inspired by the, those first couple of Bellamy aliens I showed you. Just a sense of otherness, and you know uh, that there's no hint of that kind of. What I hate about uh, the kind of stuff you sometimes see on TV. So many aliens are depicted as very conventional, bipedal forms. Speak English perfectly, and have just got a few weird forehead prosthetics, and that's the only thing that makes them alien, which really isn't how it works at all, is it? Um, all right, focusing on the man who created the character down there, the earliest. Uh, no, right. Now, this, this is the famous cover. We've already seen it, I think, uh, a few times uh, for issue number one on the 14th of April, 1950. Just in passing, it's interesting actually to compare this. With his very last cover, as I understand it, I might stand corrected here, but I think it's his last cover, for volume 10, uh, which was issue number 7, so nine years later in 1959. So you've got his first and his last cover there for Dan Dare. Um, it really shows how over the space of a decade, uh, less than a decade, an artist's style can evolve and change in all sorts of ways, from the relatively simple ink and colour work of the first cover to a much more representational, sophisticated and richer style nine years later. The left hand number one story is variously known as Pilot of the Future, the Venus story or Voyage to Venus, with the right hand images from the story Terra Nova. Whilst these are of necessity pulled off the internet so one can't be absolutely sure about the colour veracity, um, the quality of printing and in particular the colour saturation really picked up as the decade went by. It's interesting too as it shows how the pages develop between the or this next one, uh, interesting show how, how pages can develop between the rough and final stages. So that's a Frank Hampson uh, rough on the left, and you can see how it's uh, it's the same but not the same. Um, the, everything is everything is altered just a little bit. So you can see there's a, this is a man who is obsessed with um, detail and with getting it absolutely right. So these tiny little changes that take place by the time you get to the final thing. You can see they've worked over and over and over to get it just so. Uh, Bellamy, like um, all the best people, I think, was uh, an obsessive, obviously. Uh, the eagle itself, uh, sorry, they're going to go over a few things that we've already heard, but you know, just a slightly different take on it. The eagle itself had been a collaborative venture on the part of Hampson himself, and of course, the eagle's founder, the Reverend Marcus Morris, and its earliest incarnation came about in 1949. Uh, Morris had been an RAF chaplain during the war, and after that time, amongst his other priestly duties, he produced a widely circulated Christian magazine called The Anvil, on which he had employed the aspiring illustrator Frank Hampson. Uh, at the time, one of his parishioners, and looking for, for work, he had ambitions to publish something which delivered a Christian message to children through the medium of comic. Although he never referred to Eagle as a comic, it was always a magazine. He, having been very impressed with the high standard of artwork he discovered in American magazines and comics, and the, but appalled by, his, by the storylines, and to quote... Marcus Morris, 
Deplorable, nastily overviolent and obscene, often with undue emphasis on the supernatural and magical as a way of solving problems. Morris envis envisioned a character called Lex Christian, a tough fighting parson in the slums of the East End of London, whose adventures would be told in strip cartoon form, illustrated by Hampson. The two began working on a dummy of it. Eventually the name of the chief character was changed and Lex Christian became Chaplain Dan Dare of the Interplanet Patrol, uh, featured on the cover. This was the earliest incarnation in dummy form of the collaboration. I imagine the ca uh, character of Chapman Bear, uh, Dare to be loosely based on Morris himself. Um, neat little gyro car there. What, what's the word they use for the gyro car? What's it called? Uh, That's the one, yes. Um, something I've occasionally had a crack at over the years, and a lot of artists have. I think I, I think he must have invented them, but I've seen so many, and I've used one of mine. Um, for The Man Who Melted, by a uh, book by Jack Dan. Some sort of gyro car. Slightly more... You know, it's not much of the 50s kind of... Oh, no, here we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's happened before. I'll uh, just kick it off again. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> right, just got to find that particular <laughs> slide. Well, that was the whole painting, which I'm afraid it's decided to skip over. But um, anyway, um, by 1950, they had a publisher in Hulton Press, and the first issue was ready to go. Uh, Dan Dare changed from being a uh, chaplain into Colonel Dare, pilot of the future in Space Fleet. The reasons why are not recorded, apparently, but presumably suggestions from Hulton were taken on board. Uh, the Eagle logo has yet to make an appearance. It, too, would be drawn by Hampson. Uh, we get here a glimpse here of a slightly less characterful Digby um, in the middle panel to the left there. <coughs> and Sir Hubert Guest also makes an appearance, the character based on Hampson's father. Using family and friends as models uh, was an important element in Hampson's technique, his technique armoury, something I do myself actually. I'll show you a few of mine shortly. Once family have distinct advantages, they are there, geographically handy, and they're cheap. <laughs> um, and then... <laughs> And then the, sorry about the keynote um, transitions. Oh, I'm a hawk, look at that. Um, Hampson's wife, Dorothy, had come up with the name Eagle, inspired by the design of her church lectern. The comic was heavily publicised before its release. Comics, uh, copies were mailed direct to several hundred thousand people who worked with children. And a Hunt the Eagle scheme was launched, uh, whereby large papier-mâché golden eagles were set on top of several Humber Hawk cars and toured the UK. We were talking about this last night, weren't we? And then as we drove here, uh, we were passed by a Humber super snipe, wasn't yes. it? But strange yes. coincidence, because there's not many of them around. Those who spotted an eagle were offered tokens worth three threepence, which could be exchanged at news agents for a free copy of Eagle. The first issue sold about 900,000 copies, and the rest is history. A joint portrait here of Frank Hampson and the Reverend Marcus Morris, either side of their creation, Colonel Daniel McGregor Dare. This one painted by one of the regular artists of land, uh, Don Harley. Right, here are some of the interpretations by the various artists of Dan from the 50s and early 60s. Hampson's is the definitive, of course. Um, so those are classic Hampson Danders. And the others are largely attempts to emulate the style, uh, something Bellamy refused to do, insisting on his own interpretation. Uh, the degrees of success are somewhat variable, it has to be said. So there we've got uh, Don Harley top there, Harold Johns, Keith Watson, Desmond Walduck. Which one's Harold Johns? Uh, Harold Johns is um, bottom left, these two bottom left. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Right, so then, and there's the Bellamy's. You can see clearly the character's changed, but um, I've always personally rather liked that careworn, um, you know, more dramatic way of rendering him, but that's not just me. I, I, I understand people's opinions of it. 
Uh, towards the end of the first Dandere story, the exhausted Hampson fell ill and took a break in northern France to recuperate. In the Hulton, in, in the Hulton offices, Marcus Morris was hunting for ideas for the next Dandere story, uh, worried that once the Venus story ended, readers would fall away. They had to lock a million schoolboys into Dan's next adventure. They decided to advertise, but not having a story to promote, what could the advertising be about? Hampson came up with this illustration, which appeared in Picture Post on the 29th of September 1951. It ran on page three, probably the best space in the magazine because the space was free, not because it would reach the schoolboys. You can see how Hampson could handle a whole page, strong free figure drawing, full of dynamism and the promise of action to come. Hampson himself posed for a lot of the character shots along with family members and fellow artists. Apparently, and as I, met, as I mentioned before, he relied heavily on photo referencing for his characters. Um, he was an interesting pair of images showing how Hampson would set up a reference shot and the frame resulting from it. This is a technique used by many artists, both commercial and these days, fine art, well, these days and fine art too. It's often to fix things like light sources and get shadow areas correctly pl uh, placed. Also to um, help assist those of us who are not naturally good, spontaneous figure artists who, who use a lot of photo referencing. From the left here you have Hampson himself, then uh, Greta Tomlinson as Professor Peabody, uh, Robert Hampson, fa uh, Frank's father, in his role as Sir Hubert Guest, fellow artist Harold Johns being Digby, and Eric Eden as a Venusian blue-skinned Atlantean, descendants of humans taken from Earth 100,000 years before. And here too, another featuring Robert Pops Hampson, uh, this time as Theron President Kalan. <coughs> Sometimes Dad was called on to help out as Dan, here getting the pipe-smoking bit accurate. Uh, I, like many of my fellow artists, use photo reference for a great deal of my figure work. Hampson and his team did not have the luxury of time I have on single images, which can take sometimes days or even weeks to complete. Comics are a demanding business, requiring extremely intense periods of work long into the night, something that was certainly true of Hampson and his team. So mine incl inclined more towards a photograph photographic rather than a line and colour approach, uh, but the principle is the same. So with something like this one, which is a private piece I did for um, uh, and a guy... Uh, Canadian lawyer actually, based on the George R. R. Martin science fiction story, and show you how I, um, you know, I shoot, will use a model shoot, and uh, she will be incorporated into the painting, like so. Um, and this is uh, it's a paint, it's not it's an unfinished piece. This I'm still working on this, but I've got a shot of it anyway. I'm still working on the girl's face and everything. A model, a girl that she's the daughter of a fellow artist, actually an American named uh, Mark Poole, very good artist. He's got this lovely daughter Kirian who models for him occasionally, and I got her to model for me while I was over there last year. And um, uh, the painting is actually called an Esidora's Choice. Uh, so anyway, I ask this question wherever I go: Has anyone ever heard of an Esidora? You, not a single person I've yet asked knows who and it's me being a clever dick this it's the alternative name for um, Pandora and it wasn't a box it was what they call a pithos which is a buried Greek urn and the choice is that she hasn't yet taken the lid off to, um, uh, to for all the world's ills to escape hence the, uh, the little you can't really see it too well but just down on the lower third of the jar there, there's a swallow in flight and a swallow of course is a, a representation of it's a, a symbol for hope um, but I did some shots of Kirian, very obliging model, very good model, and that's how, she, how it ends up. It's a very literal use of a model, that, um, and then I just pile on the stuff over the top. Uh, occasionally I will, um, and particularly if I'm creating um, more alien forms, I will use a human reference, but it gets twisted and pulled more uh, into new forms. Um, I couldn't find, this is my youngest daughter Gwen posing for homuncularium as a personal piece and I got a very nice meld for this one but I couldn't find it so I've just had to put it on in without the uh, the reference shot and then you've got a recent horror piece actually called um, Steno and her sisters, Steno being the, the oldest of the three Gorgons, the other two being Uri, Uri, Uri. Uriale and uh, Medusa of course and this is Steno and slightly saucy shot of the model um, who then I've never shown her what I did with her <laughs> I don't know what to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure she'd be too happy about that one um, 
Uh, Frank left the comic, as I understand it, when the working conditions imposed by Eagle's new owners impressed him not one bit, and the workload was taken on chiefly by Frank Bellamy for a year, with assistance from Keith Watson, Don Harley, and the occasional, uh, occasionally freelancer Bruce Cornwell. Watson and Harley had some input through the 50s also, particularly when Hampson was suffering from ill health, along with some other artists. Greta Tomlinson, a Slade graduate, who we've had the privilege of having us with us here today. And uh, plus at varying times and varying degrees of success, Desmond Walduck, Harold Johns and Eric Eden. There may be others, it's a complex story. Various writers took on the storylines through that period too. Hampson sounds to me like something of a workaholic. And the demands of getting the weekly issue out, plus the punishing work regime he set himself and expected of others, didn't always make the easiest, him the easiest man to work with. Hampson was without doubt the foremost comic artist of his time in the, in the UK through the decade of the 50s. In fact, Hampson was voted prestigioso maestro at an international convention of strip cartoon and animated film artists held at Lucca, Tuscany in 1975. A jury of his peers gave him something called a Yellow Kid Award and declared him to be the best writer and artist of strip cartoons since the end of the Second World War, internationally, that is. I should finish perhaps with some spreads and iconic pieces of Frank Hampson, but given the nature of today's gathering, there are also a couple of other artists from that time I feel I should mention before we finish, who are also heroes of mine. My dad was an avid reader of the Daily Express back in the day, and every single day after he'd read it, I would grab it, ignore all the latest Cold War news, and zip straight to a black and white strip, Jeff Hawke, impeccably drawn by the great Sidney Jordan. I would very carefully cut that strip out, and the one after that, and the one after that, and I glued them end to end until I had complete stories which would unroll like some sort of tiny arty-farty toilet roll. Um, I had the great good fortune to meet Sidney Jordan a couple of years ago at a small convention in Bristol. He seemed not all that much older than me, um, which surprised me somewhat given that I was a kid when I was cutting Jeff Hawke out of the newspaper, but that's how the weird compressibility of time seems to work. His work seems to fit right into that uniquely British zeitgeist of the time. That's Sidney Jordan on the right there with Harry Harrison, of course. Yeah. Now, that's in Brighton in 1985. Now, Harry Harrison was a man who was to prove important in my own career in the late 70s when we collaborated on an illustrated novella called Planet Story. Um, but that's, an, that's another story. Actually, it leads off on a whole different tangent, which led to my little involvement in Hollywood, working on Blade Runner and all the rest of it. And that spreads from a meeting with Harry Harrison, but that's a big, long other story. There's more from this time in my life. Um, Captain, uh, there's, there's some Jeff Hawke by Sidney Jordan. Lovely stuff. Brilliant. I think uh, Sidney Jordan's one of the best black and white artists of that time. Yeah, a bit daft, but most aliens are pretty daft. <laughs> um, what have we got here? Uh, more from this time, well, like Captain Condor in the Lion comic for a start. I think this is Captain Condor, can't be sure anymore. Uh, some very good black and white work from Keith Watson, uh, fresh over from the Eagle in the Lion. That's another one, yes. These are, uh, as I say, these are Keith Watson, Captain Condor spreads. Another great artist, I think, yeah. Keith Watson. Wonderful stuff. And Ace O'Hara, first citizen of the space age. Anyone heard of him? He's less well known. Um, I discovered in my dad's evening paper, the South Wales Echo, art by Basil Blackcaller, Blackaller at the top there, and then Tony Spear uh, below, who took over the strip when Blackaller died at the very young age of 36. I mentioned much earlier the name of Brian Lewis, the only one of this generation of highly influential artists I met apart from Sidney Jordan. Look at this lovely bit of black and white work from Lewis. I myself only ever had one brief professional brush with Dan Dare related material. Back in the 80s there was a projected live action Dan Dare series for TV. I and other artists contribut contributed some work for this. I did a couple of otherworldly backdrops against which live action would be projected or blue screened, or whatever the term is. Unfortunately, the series went down the toilet and I was left with a couple of big oil paintings with no, nowhere to go. Not really usable in any other, any, any other commercial context, although a collector eventually bought, brought, bought them from me. I'll sell, any, sell anything, me. Um, <laughs> so that's my damn dare backdrop. And I suppose the idea was that um, the figures would be sort of superimposed on this front area and see marching across the terrain. Um, 
Those other artists, they all had their place feeding my imagination, uh, but in the end, Frank Hampson tops them all. Hampson's influence is clear through all this material. His success spawned many in his own, own world, but he is absolutely king of this domain. No one, no one can ever take that from him. We've barely mentioned Dan's arch enemy, the mighty Mekon, or the, or the capital city of the northern hemisphere of Venus, Maconta, home of the humorless reptilian trees and their huge brained leader, the Mekon. What an iconic character. I think he's one of those beings, one of those inventions that almost everyone, whether you were into Dandera or not, recognises the Mekon. Um, right. <laughs> Writer, writers of a certain age found themselves maybe unconsciously referring back to the Mekon in some of their own outlandish characters. A cover commission that came my way was Colin Greenland's Seasons of Plenty. He was Ecstasca, uh, a bizarre being indeed, exactly as Colin describes he, she, or it in the novel. Definite hints of the Mekon here. If I click on it, you see the whole painting, but it may do that switching itself off thing, so let's have a look. No, I think we're going to be all right. It was one of my more ambitious pieces at the time. It's a lot going on in it. And then we've got, of course, Maconta itself. Fantastic image, that, I think. Um, the world-renowned architect Norman Foster grew up with the eagle, and he has freely admitted to the influence of the, ar the architecture of Hampson's Dandere in his own mighty and futuristic constructs. The gherkin is, to my, higher, uh, at my eye, pure Hampsonian. That's pure Hampson. Yeah. Uh, you can see it too in uh, Renzo's piano sh Renzo Piano's Shard. Sorry, pushed twice there. Richard, uh, Richard Rogers, uh, yeah, you get the g gist. Uh, Richard Rogers' uh, Millennium Dome. Definitely Hampsonian, that, I think. And uh, Nicholas Grimshaw's Eden Project. These are all shapes that could exist very happily in a Frank Hampson spread. Hampson's machines are amazing. It's hard to believe that this stuff goes back to the early 50s. The Galactic Galleon. First human-built ship capable of interstellar flight. That still looks cooler than most stuff being turned out by today's artists. It is, I think, a particularly nice Hampson spread. It also looks like he spent a lot more time on it, to my way of thinking. Um, of course... Hmm? Sorry, what date is that? Oh, that's a good question. So if it's, uh, it's the... Yeah, because what was the story? Late, late 50s, yes, yeah. It's in fact fantastic, terrific. More ships. There it is in flight, um, same vessel. I was mightily impressed by it, I recall. Sort of pacing the ship's bottom left there. And his, um, his, his cabins and the controls, uh, you know, they are so so sort of considered and um, you know even today that looks yes you know, in 1958 is it I think it says there that wouldn't look out of place in a brand new machine would it have you know it's I mean when I was flying the jet provost in uh, 1968 which is 10 years later the the control the console of that could be could have been a Spitfire it looked like World War II vintage extraordinary right I'm just um, okay, more ships. Um, ah, right, okay. Because the definit de definitive Dandair ship is Anastasia, described yes. earlier. Bottom right, pursued by Treen ships. Um, nice one of Anastasia. Um, I, I, love, I always loved those Treen ships, by the way. I thought they were fantastic. Uh, here we go, there's Anastasia coming down there. Um, literally just finishing off. Deep space, here we come. You know, oh. If only it could be like that. Uh, to momentarily pop back over to one of the other artists, I always really like this Keith Watson take on, on Anastasia. Anast Anastasia? Anastasia, how do you pronounce it? That's a lovely shot of it, I think. Uh, as it says in the... Uh, here we go, hang on, next one. As it says in the yellow box, Anastasia was a super spaceship named after Digby's aunt, presented to Dandere by the great Vulvanusians when he had brought peace to their troubled planet. The Anastasia, with its four methods of propulsion incorporating the foremost advances of both the Trines and the Therons, the once warring inhabitants of Earth's sister world. When I look at my own vessels, I cannot but see the influence of Hampson in some of my retro forms. 
Most modern artists working with this material tend towards an angular, utilitarian look, a complex collision of elements, strangeness implied in their unlikely non-logical structures. I prefer the look of machines that suggest a different aesthetic, but quite clearly a sense of design behind the mindset. Frank did this, and I hope I do. I never grew away from that way of thinking, something Frank Hampson did to my brain a half century and more ago. So it's a little run of those. These are various book jacket pieces for different, uh, different books by different writers. And these are all in oil? Uh, they're a mixture. Uh, most of what you're looking at here are either acrylics like this one or digital like the last two. I work in both areas really. Um, no, I've not worked in oils now for a few years, but I want to get back to it. Another one of the um, Peter Hamilton ships, the Peter Hamilton uh, Pandora's Star, that one's called. I've got a Greg Bear novel called Slant. Greg Bear, the writer, actually designed the Swan Jet himself. Isn't the writer who's also an amateur artist? I do wish they'd leave it to the artist sometimes. <coughs> um, there's another Peter Hamilton piece, um, first part of the Nightstone trilogy. Uh, his Conquering Sword for Kate Elliott novel. And then the last of mine, this is uh, The Long Run by um, Daniel Keyes Moran. It was after a bit of vertiginous feeling in this. I painted every single window on that skyscraper from top to bottom. <laughs> Uh, finally, here's one of my favourite panels from the Dan Dare strip showing Anastasia as she finally comes into land on the wonderfully exotic surface of Terra Nova. I believe this is one of the last panels Hampson provided for the Dan Dare strip, but it has so much in it that for me sums up the genius of Dan's creator. Wonderful detail, a real sense of the exotic, total conviction. I, for one, will forever live with the fond boyhood memories of the work of Frank Hampson and Colonel Dan Dare. It was food to, to an imagination that craved strange stuff, otherworldly stuff. And I'm not sure that it's the case that if Dan Day hadn't have existed, that I would be living the same life I'm living, living now. The power of great comics to a young mind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, I'm sure there are some questions here. I can see Richard's ready to ask straight away. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, thank you um, for providing such inspiration because your Gauzy fighter um, inspired me back in the early 80s in, um, because you did a cutaway of it. And no, it was, it was so good, it allowed me to do a cutaway of a large Mars spaceship to take my entire school in Cardiff to, to Mars and it helped me out immensely with the girls as a result. So thank you ever so much. It was brilliant. Gosh, that was a cache of girls that never came across a few But the cutaway, remember, was actually drawn by Brian Lewis. Um, I did the painting for the cover, but Brian Lewis did the cutaway. Ah. So that's not actually mine. Oh, okay. So, not guilty. <laughs> Any more questions? We've got time for two more. Here we are. A comment first. This is, this, is, this is more of a comment rather than um, rather than a question. You mentioned about the difference between Frank Hampson's Dan Dare mm. and Bellamy's Dan Dare. Mm. And I think the key to that difference is that they were both basing the character on themselves. Yes, yes, um, yes. Frank Hampson clearly... Um, Based, based the character on, on, on himself, yes, yes. even to the, to the eyebrow someone mentioned earlier. That was, that was inspired by a, by a scar that he had oh, that he really? picked up yes. during the war. So you mean physically so uh, he was, based, uh, but you mean also perhaps yeah. temperamentally, because the Bellamy one is always seen as a darker kind of character, isn't yeah. he? But, I, mean, I, I think, I think the Bellamy, like. I mean, if you look at Bellamy and mm. look at Bellamy's down there, yeah. That looks remarkably like Bellamy. Bellamy, and I'm sure some of those shots were him yes. looking in the mirror oh, and yes. drawing his own face yes. and it's expression. An, it's an old trick and a good one. Mm. Mm. I mean, he, he could he could draw mm. characters mm. as they were 
I mean, he could, he could draw uh, Sir Hubert. Yes. And, yes. It, and we'll make it look like Sir Hubert. Yes, Sir Hubert, yes, yeah, yes. In the same way that he could draw yes. um, Churchill when he did yes, Churchill yes. and make it look like Churchill. He had so it wasn't he couldn't draw it like <laughs> Dan Dare, a lot no. like Hampson's Dan Dare, no. but he chose to put himself into it, I think. Yes, yes. He also, though, he did have a, um, a, a, a different set of skills, I think, that are more, in some ways, they're more kind of global, if you like. That's why I called the Hampson look a little bit, when I say parochial, I mean in the kindest way, it's very English, whereas Bellamy's was more international looking, maybe influenced by American comics to some extent. There's an angularity to the, the way the frames are often uh, placed on the page and uh, the drama of the lighting on the figures, which is a little different, I think, yeah, um, it, which gives them, the, which I rather like. Um, but it did change the thing very fundamentally, I must say. Yeah. One last one. There you go. Oh. Um, um, thank you very much. I um, I wondered if you could remind me who, who was the artist that drew Rick Kirby in the Daily Mail. Rick Kirby, you know that. No, I'm not sure. Right? What was it? Well, I don't know what that was. We're drawing a blank. What? We're so all drawing a blank. <laughs> someone said it yeah, in the back. Alex Raymond. Alex Raymond. Alex Raymond. Alex Raymond. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. So we've got the answer in the room. There you go. If you're not, if you don't find it in this room, you're not going to find it. Well, in that's there. right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's that was okay. my opener. My pleasure.